everybody. So if I seem a little stressed, it's because I just realized that I've been a poopy vet with handling vet or rabbits for the last 10 years, 15 years, right? That talk was awesome. And whoever was talking about vet tech schools, talk to the veterinary schools. I mean, we don't get anything like that. And, and I've been to every veterinary school in the U.S. And certainly some programs have a great exotics program. But a lot of schools I go to have absolutely nobody, nothing. Well, let's talk to the right people because it's really about finding the right people and changing their perspectives. I mean, there's a lot of top leaders in this area. There's an academia in the back right there at Western. Uh, oh, we, uh, we go to Bunny. <laughs> yeah, so huge opportunity out there, but it, it, absolutely great. And again, I'm probably a little stressed because uh, I've been not doing a good job for a very, very long time. But so speaking of poop, we're going to talk about poop for the next hour. I hope everybody's okay with that. So. <laughs> I like to introduce by saying I give a really shitty talk, but that's perfect for this topic. Um, my wife doesn't think that's funny. Can you see when I'm over here? Okay. I tend to be a mosier, so I walk around a lot. Don't be uncomfortable. I may sit in your lap, but I won't stay there very long because it's that old hugging thing that Susan was talking about. So let's talk about rabbits. Obviously a great topic. Um, we're going to hit on a couple of these topics. Uh, just to kind of give you a top level overview, and uh, those great ladies took a little bit of my time, but I'm going to take all of my time, so uh, don't rush me. We're going to talk about behavior a little bit. Uh, they hit on behavior, behavior links to how we want to feed these animals as well. Uh, I'm going to bore you with a little bit of types and classifications of herbivores, but we're going to spend a whole heck of a lot of time talking about anatomy and talking about physiology. We all talk about fiber, we all talk about nutrition, but unless you can really understand the way that GI tract works, you don't really understand why is fiber fiber so stinking important. It sounds like there was a really great talk yesterday with Dr. Smith that I hate that I missed, but I'm sure she hit on some of these topics as well. And then we'll kind of tie things up at the end with talking about diet types. We all know there's a lot out there. It's good, bad, ugly, great, different. Um, but at the end of the day, if you understand that anatomy, you understand that physiology, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to explain why our muesli mix is so poor. Why do we want to feed the animals this way? So hopefully I'll leave you with some take home notes. And again, uh, I suspect this is a lot of information that hopefully you guys are already aware of, uh, but hopefully I can dig in and do it a little bit more. So one of the things I think is always really relevant, it doesn't matter what type of talk I'm giving, whether I'm talking to veterinary students uh, or professionals like yourself, is, is where have we come from? And the reality is, as we all know, as terrible as it may be, 25, 30 years ago, most rabbits that were owned were owned for a reason that we don't want to talk about, right? They were a production animal. I mean, it's no different than we talk about guinea pigs, no different than we talk about chinchillas. These are production-based animals. And the reality of that is that we've only seen this, this transition, and I kind of say cage to couch and barn to bed, uh, we've only seen this transition in the last really maybe 20, 25 years for the, for the majority of it. The challenge with that is that when we think about the dog and the cat world, we've been working on their nutrition for 50, 60, 70 years. Lots and lots of money, lots and lots of emphasis. Yet when we think about rabbits, most of the literature we have is based on getting a rabbit big and fat quick, so it can be a meat animal. We don't have lots and lots of good research and a really, really in-depth, scientifically backed uh, information about nutrition. So we're trying to learn more, we're trying to do more research, but the evolution we're seeing has really only been in the last 20 to 25 years. So we're learning a lot, uh, but we certainly have a lot more uh, to learn. So the revolution is occurring. We're investing in research. More and more companies are paying attention to it. People like you guys are getting out there and educating people, uh, which is absolutely great. We're seeing owners, we're seeing caregivers say, you know, I want to understand more. I want to understand why I should be feeding fiber. And again, hopefully I'm going to send you home with some information there. One of the things I always want to do is we always want to be ready for the future. Have you guys heard of designer breeds? Okay, you heard of this one? The Puggo. Have you heard of the, the Chowini? This is called Great Marketing, okay, right? Fancy market. This is a new one. I just came back from Boston. This is the Bug, yeah, very cute. But I wanted to give you guys a heads up about some new designer exotic companion mammals that are coming. Has anybody heard about this one? This is the Chug. And Dr. Fisher is an expert in their nutrition. He'll be talking about it later on. But this is the one that I really want you guys to be aware of. So in California, they can't have ferrets, right? So they have the carnavage. Okay? But I, I think this is a really empowering thing because we all have an expectation here, being a prey species, but with the carnavage, it's this amazing <laughs> other animal, right? And I love doing some vet students because half of them look at me like, I can't tell if he's joking or not. <laughs> I, I really quickly go on. So why do we worry about 
about nutrition. Why is nutrition so dang important? And it's not just about rabbits. It's about every single animal that we see. Nutrition is something that we can control. We can't really control genetics by the time we get that animal there. We can't control a lot what goes on in the environment, but nutrition is something we can have an input to control. And especially with rabbits, this is Francis Harcourt Brown's etiology of gastric stasis. Now, I don't care how long you look at that, it only gets more painful, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, I can't cure disease or completely prevent disease by feeding an animal right, but I can certainly decrease the likelihood of I can decrease the prevalence of which is going to reoccur. And when I think about all these common disease patterns that I see in companion mammals, GI disease, dental disease, obesity, urinary tract, bladder stones, bladder sludge, and even neoplasia, those are all diseases that I think you guys would agree with are all directly and or indirectly related to nutrition. So it is a real, real opportunity, and again, not just rabbits, all companion animals that we see, taking the time to educate mom and dad about what is good, what is bad. Because the ramifications of not making good decisions don't typically occur right away, they occur over the period of time. We see gastric, gastric stasis so, so frequently. What's the underlying etiology there? Is it something with lack of fiber intake over a long period of time? Too high levels of simple carbohydrates over a period of time? We certainly know it's multifactorial, but let's try to control the things that we can potentially control. So when we talk about herbivores, we're going to break them into just two preeminently overarching categories. We've got our four gut fermenters, so multiple chamber stomach, cows, regurgitation. Um, that is the process by which they ferment and they break down fiber. The secondary side of our herbivores would be our hindgut fermenters. So our single chamber stomachs, our monogastrics, no capacity or ability for regurgitation. And we further break that down into what we call colonic fermentators, so elephants, horses, and then our sequel fermenters, rabbits, guinea pigs, and chinchillas. When we look at classification, that more goes, gets into how do these animals forage and feed naturally in the wild. We think about bulk and roughage eaters eating very, very large quantities, and they're not very specific to what they're eating. They're eating a lot of whatever they can find. But when we get down to rabbits, which would typically fall in the same category as guinea pigs and chinchillas, they're a concentrate selector. And you guys have all experienced this. In the wild, if you watch a rabbit, it's going to eat a little bit of this for run over here. Well, first of all, it's going to look up because it's afraid something's going to eat it, right? Then it's going to run over here and eat a little bit of this tree, a little bit of this grass. It's concentrate selecting. They will naturally always pick out the lowest fiber, highest nutrient dense plant material they can find because in their mind they're thinking, how long do I get to eat before I get chased back into my hole? That's a natural behavior that allows these animals to survive in a pretty rough environment in the wild. Now what happens when we bring them into captivity where it's you know, perfectly 70 degrees every day, you know, their food kind of floats down magically from the heavens, right? <laughs> they're not running from that coyote. But they are still wired to think, I want to pick out the things that taste the best, the things that are the most caloric dense. I'm going to concentrate select if you give me the opportunity to do that. And that's an important natural behavior uh, that we need to be aware of and the implications of how we feed these animals in captivity. <laughs> now, I truly believe that every morning rabbits wake up and say, I think that log might kill me, okay? <laughs> My point with this, and this is what I really try to take home to veterinary students, is that these are prey animals, okay? They know that. I don't... They know it, they don't know it, you don't understand what I'm saying. They understand they were put on this earth for that reason. So, so many of the things that we do to these animals cause stress. My perfect example of realizing how poorly I was handling these animals. What does a typical rabbit think when it comes into a vet clinic? Because what is Micah doing? Grabbing it out, redoing it, putting it on the table, it probably smells like cat pee, and there's a, a dog barking in the room next door, right? What am I doing to that prey species who's probably only coming in because they're already stressed, they've been hiding clinical signs for a long period of time? The reason that this is so important, is especially when we're educating owners, is they don't want to show us how they really feel. Now, a healthy rabbit, if we're transitioning a diet appropriately, we're controlling environmental stress, they do well. But again, these animals are so good at not showing us how they really, really feel, we always want to take the time to educate mom and dad about transitions. And I love this slide because when I first put this PowerPoint together, my son was saying, he's like, Dad, is that the front or the back? <laughs> That's a good question, Tegan. So again, taking the time to make sure that we understand that when we change things with these guys, it can have a lot, a lot of stress. We really want to be gradual and thoughtful as what's the implication no matter what we're changing. <laughs> so again, they may be prey species, but awful smart prey species. All right, so let's kind of look at the overview from a top level before we really kind of get into the nuts and the bolts <laughs> of the anatomy. So we know these animals are designed to eat plant material all the way from the oral cavity down through the backside. That's what they're designed is to ingest 
break down and ferment those complex plant carbohydrates. We also know that these animals, again, have a simple stomach, single stomach, which is really combined with a very unique process of hindgut cecal fermentation. We're going to talk a lot about the hindgut, the cecum and the large intestine, and some really unique factors that occur in that component of their GI tract that kind of differentiates these animals uh, from a lot of the other species that we see. We know they're a concentrate selector. You give them the opportunity, that's what they're naturally going to do. Most human beings, whether we want to admit it, are concentrate selectors. Okay? We pick out what tastes good. We don't choose a balanced diversity of the nutrients. But at the end of the road, we know these animals are designed to eat large quantities of very low, high, low energy density, high fiber food. That's what they're designed to eat. And their GI tract with their oral cavity and their constantly growing teeth, their high gut cecal fermentation, is what allows these animals to su survive on complex plant carbohydrates, high fiber that is not nutritionally dense, it's not calorically dense. So keeping that in mind. As we move into that hindgut, we have a really unique process in these guys called the colonic separation mechanism. And it's that mechanism within their colon and within their cecum that again allows rabbits to utilize large quantities of fiber and effectively eliminate the component of fiber they can't use and hold on to the component of fiber that they can benefit from. And that's going to make a lot more sense as we kind of dig into this system. When we think about rabbits and guinea pigs and chinchillas, so much of how we feed them, so much of their anatomy is similar. But one area that is truly different is in that colonic separation mechanism. So rabbits have what's called a washback mechanism, okay? because rabbits truly focus on differentiating fiber based on size, whereas guinea pigs and chinchillas, which are actually much more effective at fermenting and breaking down fiber than rabbits are, they focus on a mucus trap mechanism, where what they're focused on is holding on to those key gut flora, keeping those bacteria in their cecum so they can be as effective with fermentation as they possibly can. So that is one area where we do differentiate our exotic companion mammals between rabbits and guinea pigs, uh, as well as chinchillas. At the end of the road, though, rabbits, like all herbivores, have a symbiotic relationship with gut flora. It's those bacteria that allow these animals to break down and ferment complex plant carbohydrates. You and I, as omnivores, our body produces enzymes, digestive enzymes, to help us to break down fiber to some degree and those complex carbohydrates. Rabbits produce very, very few of those digestive enzymes. So they rely specifically on those gut flora. So as much as we talk about feeding the rabbit, I think a really good way to think about it is feeding those gut flora. They're the munchkins that we want to keep happy and healthy, doing their job, keeping the environment that they live in as stable and, and steady as we possibly can. When we disrupt those gut flora, we lead to low-grade dysbiosis. All kinds of very negative things can occur, the majority of which are subclinical. The rabbit's not going to say, God, I got a little dysbiosis going on today. I just don't feel that good. Okay? But we have to be aware that things like medications and environment and changing food and environmental stress, all of those things can have a significant impact on the gut flora. And especially in the hindgut, that can have a big impact on how these animals function uh, from a fiber standpoint. We talk about fiber so much, but at the end of the day, fiber, and specifically the indigestible components of fiber, things like the lignans, is what stimulates peristalsis, keeps that GI tract moving all the time. Because these animals need that GI tract moving all the time, we always want to focus on keeping fiber into that system. And for me as a veterinarian, that comes down to what am I doing that may be slowing that GI tract down or stressing that animal out. Maybe it's an elective procedure, some type of stressful environment. Well, I want to get fiber and hydration back into that animal system as quick as I possibly can. If they're sitting there and they're not moving and they're painful, there's very little going on in that GI tract. But fiber and the indigestible components of fiber cell wall is what keeps that system moving. And that's why we want fiber in their system as frequently and often as we possibly can. <laughs> I love that picture. All right. So this is a top level view of the fiber pathway. Uh, it's, for me, it's the bagel pathway. I'm probably right there with my bagel from this morning. But that's an overarching view. And when you look at that, that's no different than from an omnivore like a dog, a hypercarnivore like a cat mouth or esophagus, mouth, stomach, small intestine, cecum, colon, and out the back door we're going to make poop. When we think about our hindgut fermenters, we obviously have the unique behavior of the production of the second type of stool. Okay? Uh, I jokingly call it the midnight snack. Okay? And that's that second stool, the cecal, the cecal trough, the night stool, that those animals are going to re-ingest. And I absolutely love new rabbit owners when you come into the room and they're sitting there just kissing on their bunny and you just kind of smile and you're like, you know your rabbit eats its own poop. And half, of them, half of them get grossed out, and half of them are like, okay, and they go right back to making out. And I'm like, I'm not sure what that means to me. But, uh, 
this is a very important process, and you guys know this, and you've heard this, but again, when we start to break down that cecotroph, which we will, and we look at all those key nutrients that are in that cecotroph, if that animal is not readjusting that cecotroph, they are missing out on a lot of very, very key, key nutrients. Now, that's not necessarily going to make a rabbit instantly sick overnight, but over a period of time of not getting those volatile fatty acids, the vitamin B and the vitamin K, that rabbits need those gut flora to synthesize, that's going to lead to you know, low-grade nutritional imbalances and issues. It's also the reason why if I have an owner call and say, hey, my dog's got a little diarrhea, no big deal, let's watch it for a day or two and see how it goes. When rabbits have that much dysbiosis and they don't have any solidity to their stool, we know they're not re-ingesting that sequotroph, okay? And again, that has much bigger implications than it has in an omnivorous type species. So let's start in the oral cavity and we'll kind of work our way through uh, the whole system. So again, we know these guys are concentrate selectors. We know their eyes, being a prey species, are laterally placed, so they can't see directly in front of their nose. So they're using their nose, they're using their lips to kind of carefully manipulate, concentrate, select, typically picking out the more kind of soft, supple leaf component of whatever plant material. And you guys have all seen that when you put that nice big pile of fresh hay in there, they're grazing around, they're sorting it around. Um, they're concentrate selecting is what they're doing. They're gonna use those front incisors to manipulate and cut and scissor off the plant material before they manipulate it back to their cheek teeth. And we've all seen that really cute rapid side-to-side -side grinding motion that those animals use. But it's that real, real fast, and I think, um, I think there's a dental lecture later on today, so we're not gonna talk a lot about that. But it's the fiber that provides that dental wear, and specifically the indigestible components of fiber and even the natural silicates that occur within plant material. In effect, acting as almost sandpaper, and providing that ab abrasiveness to the teeth to prevent that malocclusion or, or elongation from occurring. And sometime, I would suggest you do it when you're by yourself, Try to chew that fast, okay? It's, I do. I, I try to do it public, and I had stuff all over my face. But do it by yourself. It's really, really fast. But that's that really, really rapid side-to-side -side chewing motion that these animals use to again break down, cut up, abrasively tear apart that fiber before they swallow it, which is again providing that mechanical wear and tear um, to that dentition. The unique factor to point out is that rabbits do swallow their cecotrophs whole. Guinea pigs and chinchillas, they don't care. They just chew them up but rabbits actually swallow their cecotrophs whole when they re-ingest them. And the reason that occurs, and, and again, this is something you guys know, those cecotrophs are provided in mucus. They're covered in mucus, which is protecting the gut flora that are still within that cecotroph, that are continuing that process of bacterial fermentation. By the rabbit swallowing them whole, they're maintaining that barrier, which allows that process of fermentation to continue to occur within the stomach. So we've moved out of the oral cavity, down that esophagus, and now we're sitting in our stomach, okay? Makes up a fairly small component of their total GI volume compared to a lot of our omnivorous species. Uh, it's a thin-walled organ, non-compartmentalized, has a very well-developed cardiac sphincter. All of our exotic companion mammals, again, prevents regurgitation, uh, prevents vomiting. Now that's certainly something we wanna be aware of because if we think of an animal who's getting gas production because of whatever reason, excessive amounts of gas production, that gas can only go one way. It can only go one direction certainly a much bigger deal than we have a species who theoretically can eruptate or remove that gas out of their oral cavity, which these species cannot. So when we look physiologically at the stomach, we know that it typically has a very, very low pH. Uh, and that does change a little bit when they re-ingest those cecotrophs. The pH is higher in weanlings who are trying to establish their gut flora. And for a long time, the belief was it's such an acidic, low pH, maybe there's really not a lot of gut flora living in that stomach. But Karen Rosenthal, who a lot of you have probably heard of, uh, did a really, really cool study about probably been six or seven years ago using PCR and DNA extraction to identify gut flora. And she found something like 60 to 70 different species of gut flora that live in the stomach alone. Roughly half we couldn't even characterize, which means we don't even know what they are. So again, great indication if we know something, we have a lot to learn when it comes to the GI flora of these guys, which we know uh, is absolutely important to how their GI tract works. So we know within their stomach, they're gonna see the production of hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen. Again, that's gonna kind of facilitate the degradation and breaking down of proteins and the amino acids that are in proteins, some of those more simple base carbohydrates and fats. Uh, but again, within the stomach and even within the small intestine, we're not seeing the degradation or the breakdown of fiber. These animals aren't producing the digestive enzymes from their pancreas that you and I do as an omnivore, so that fiber's on a racetrack, and it's on a racetrack down to the hindgut, down to the cecum and the large intestine because that's where those microflora live at. Never empty. And again, this really draws back to the fact that these animals can't vomit. Fiber is consistently pushing and providing that peristaltic motion. 
And there's even been studies that have shown after like 24 hours of fasting, there's still components of ingested within the stomach. So again, we want fiber in that system. We want that fiber and hydration keeping that system moving along uh, as best we possibly can. So again, esophagus, stomach, now we're going to move into the small intestine. And the first thing to point out is that the small intestine makes up a pretty dang small percentage of their total GI volume. When you look at most of our common omnivores or, or hypercarnivores like a, car a cat or a ferret, I almost said carnabbit there, that was almost a slip. Uh, that's going to make up about 30 to 35 percent of their total GI volume. So you can see with the hind gut for men, or the small intestine is a pretty small percentage of their total GI tract. But again, recognizing how big the hind gut is, how big the cecum is, and really breaking it down and understanding that when we look at the small intestine, we're preeminently looking at those key nutrients the first time through, the simple carbohydrates, the fats, the proteins, but more importantly, when we're re-ingesting the cecotrophs and all the key nutrients that are in there, that's when we're getting the passive absorption of the volatile fatty acids, the vitamins and the minerals. Now, one thing that's really unique to rabbits, and rabbits, I believe, are the only species that have this, at the very distal end of the ileum, so we start with here duodenum, jejunum is the longest section, and then at the very last section of the small intestine is the ileum. At the distal end of the ileum is a dilation, and that's referred to as the sacculus rotundus. Yeah, I think I've got a picture here. Um, so here, we're looking at small intestine coming down here, and that dilation at the distal end of the ileum right here, that's the sacculus rotundus, unique to rabbits. We don't see this in guinea pigs. Uh, we don't see this in chinchillas. And while we've got this slide up here, so again, small intestine right here. This is our sacculus rotundus. This is our cecum that you can see right here. Those are those big sacculations you see on the cecum. And then the other side going out the back door is our colon right here. Now, when you read the textbooks, they break the colon into three sections, ascending, descending, and traverse. But most of the time, most people now are simply saying the ascending and the descending. And it's easy to differentiate the two. Hopefully you never see this and you never need to differentiate. I, I don't think the pointer the laser pointer is working. Oh, okay. It's yeah. really, really sad. You can't see that? Can you no. Now we can. It's up there. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a translucent screen. So it's going can somebody come up here and stand and just walk around and point on it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, sacculus rotundus is sitting right here. So here's our ilium coming down. This is our sacculus rotundus. So that's the dilation of the distal end of the ilium. Here's our, and I'll show you some other slides here too, but this is again the cecum, which has those big sacculations that you can see there, and it has three folds, which I'll show you later. And then again, large intestine is right here. So in large intestine, a great way to look at it, and what I was saying is hopefully you never ever see large intestine like this. This is obviously not a good situation. Um, this is our ascending colon. And the ascending colon is easy to differentiate because of these sac-like costri that you can see here, and these muscular bands, okay? Whereas the descending colon, is smooth walled, no hostrate, no tanning. That's how you differentiate those two. Right at the demarcation of the ascending colon and the descending colon is a really unique area called the fusi coli. And the fusi coli is kind of like the intestinal brain of the hind gut. And you're going to see why that fusi coli is so important because there is an amazing process, that colonic separation mechanism I talked to you about earlier, which I'm going to show you, is the movement of particles back and forth between the cecum and the large intestine. The fusi coli, which lives right there, is what controls that mechanism. Again, bear with me. I'll get to some other slides that will help that make a lot more sense. So again, within the small intestine, we're going to have hydrochloric acid. We're going to have pepsin. We're breaking down those simple carbohydrates, extracting those nutrients. Uh, again, we're focused on getting that fiber all the way down to the cecum because that's where that fiber degradation can occur. Now, an interesting thing to note is that motilin, which is an amino acid hormone, is one of the things that stimulates gut peristalsis, keeps that system moving, but its, its release is inhibited by carbohydrates. So when we give rabbits carbohydrates, specifically refined and simple carbohydrates, we're decreasing the production of one of the most important hormones that keeps that system moving. So we know carbohydrates are wrong nutritionally, but we also know from a hormonal standpoint, they're going to slow down peristalsis on top of putting simple sugars in there. So don't ever feed yogurt drops ever again. I'm being sarcastic. I know you will, but we want to avoid, <laughs> let's be honest, we want to avoid simple-based carbohydrates like that because they're not the right nutrition. And even beyond that, they change the hormonal functionality uh, of the GI tract. So again, really, really focusing on the small intestine, we want to focus on the degradation of those cecotrophs and the key nutrients that are in the cecotrophs. All those nutrients are absorbed within the duodenum uh, and within the jejunum. The key nutrients would be volatile fatty acids. And there's many, many different types. That's our key energy source for all herbivores.
herbivores, not just hindgut fermenters, water, protein, and amino acids. And an interesting thing to point out, when we talk about protein, the building blocks of protein is amino acids. Okay? That is what makes up protein. Interestingly enough, with rabbits, they get upwards of 25 to 30 percent of the protein they need from the amino acids of gut flora. So when they're re-ingesting those cecotrophs, the bacteria that are living in there provide a key component of those amino acids and protein that a rabbit needs to survive. And then vitamin B, vitamin K, again, rabbits are reliant on their gut flora to produce those vitamins. Guinea pigs and chinchillas are not. So we need that cecotroph for all these different nutritional factors that we can see here. So now we're going to move into the hindgut. And again, this is where the fun begins. It's where the party lives. They have a very unique system. That's that colonic separation mechanism that I was talking to you a little bit of earlier. Rabbits have the washback mechanism. I know wash isn't a word, but I'm from Nebraska. It's what I say. <laughs> Don't make fun of me. Washback mechanism is what I probably should say. And then guinea pigs have the mucus trap mechanism. Guinea pigs and chinchillas are much more effective at breaking down fiber than rabbits are. So that process is completely different, and we're going to break down how it's different. When we look at the cecum, we know that the cecum is the largest organ in the GI tract of rabbits. Upwards of 40% of their total GI volume in guinea pigs, upwards of 60% of their total GI volume. So it's a really, really important component of their total GI tract. We know within that it's a very thin-walled organ. Uh, it's got three separate gyrae or folds to it, which I'll show you another picture here in just a little bit. And we know that with the very distal end or the tip of the cecum, well, here's those three folds I was talking to you about. There's our cecum, oh, sorry, I forgot about the laser pointer, just yell at me. Here's those three folds that I was talking about, and at the very distal tip, or the very end of the actual cecum, is the cecal appendix. And the cecal appendix does a couple of really important things. It helps to pump water into that system. Getting water into the system, which helps that process of fermentation, and it also produces bicarbonate. Bicarbonate ions help to buffer the production of volatile fatty acids. When fermentation is occurring, there's a lot of amazing, unique things that are going on inside of the cecum, not just peristalsis. There's a lot of chemical reactions that are occurring, and the production of volatile fatty acids are buffered by the production of bicarbonate ion. We'll talk more about that as well. So when you think about the cecum, you want to think about everything that's in there. You've got food, not just fiber, whatever that rabbit is eating. You're going to have heat, you're going to have moisture, and you're going to have gut flora. When I say gut flora, certainly bacteria are the majority of that, but there's fungi, there's protozoa, there's all kinds of different organisms that live in there. But all of those organisms in that environment is what facilitates the process of bacterial fermentation. The fermentation is the breaking down and the degrading of fiber, which is a complex plant carbohydrate. When we look at those gut flora, again guys, billions and billions of different types. And, and as much as we think we know, we have a lot to learn. And I'm going to give you a little cool tidbit, so I'm going to tell you, I'm just finishing up a really cool study where we're looking at using PCR to identify the impact of gut flora on different diets. It's going to be unbelievable. Um, so there's a little tempt that I can't tell you anymore and keep to myself, but we're working on it. But it's going to really, really change our perspective because as important as these gut flora are, we don't know who they are. We don't know how many are there. We don't know the impact of diet. And there's a lot of important foundational stuff that we need to be aware of. One thing to point out, though, is that lactobacillus, and I think this was in somebody else's notes, are not normal gut flora. So from a probiotic standpoint, there is not a probiotic on the marketplace that, in my opinion, provides any true benefits to the hindgut. Is that a thumbs up or a? OK, just making sure. I wasn't sure what finger that was when you put it up in the air. I'm like, sorry. Yeah. Now, I will say there's not research there. We don't know what the normal flora is, okay? We also don't have current ability to get those gut flora not only to survive the manufacturing process, but remember, we have to get them to survive the acidity of the stomach to get all the way through the small intestine to colonize in the hindgut. Now, when you give the probiotics that are out there, they're dying with the, if there are living bugs, they're dying within the stomach. Now, the rabbit's still theoretically benefiting from that. It's absorbing and utilizing those amino acids, but not from the standpoint of colonizing the hindgut. Okay, so I don't want to say all probiotics are bad. We just have to understand what they're there for and what they're really doing versus what people's perceptions of them are. Now, I certainly hope that someday I can say this is normal gut flora for a rabbit, and this is a probiotic that we can use, and we know it's going to get to the hindgut. We're a long, long ways from getting there. That's just the reality of where we're at. I have a question. I have yep, a, I'm sorry. I have a, a comment. I don't think well, it's kind of a, So, first, um, what about prebiotic fiber instead of probiotics? Because this is always my issue with probiotics, is they don't affect the gut flora of rabbits. My other issue is um, what about say less probiotics instead of PCR? 
stable isotope probing. I love it when I get questions that I have no idea what they mean. <laughs> so stable isotope probing is where you would introduce um, a stable isotope like uh, a carbon-14 or 15, okay. I believe, because it's not radioactive. Um, and then you would collect the DNA from the, the animal and then uh, separate it with centrifugation because the label Great question. I, I honestly don't have an honest answer, I'll be honest with you. Um, PCR, historically we use culture and sensitivity, but unfortunately culture and sensitivity is not accurate. There's so many environmental factors that have implications with that. Well, that's a whole other thing, especially anaerobic. Now PCR, where you're actually identifying DNA, is a step in the right direction. The biggest problem with that is that you've got so many extraneous factors that can come into play with what DNA you're extracting. And secondary to that, you have to be able to compare that DNA to something. So again, we run into the circumstance where we know there's all these gut flora, but we've only got biomarkers for half of them that we can identify. Um, I, I don't have an educated answer there for you, but um, find me afterwards because I'd be happy to dig into that and try to get an educated. I can't promise because I'm not that educated, but I'll try. I'll find some, I'll find some smart people. Um, my point is, is that we know a lot and we have a lot to learn, but I do want to point out it's not just bacteria. Fungi and yeasts play very, very integral and important roles in the hindgut fermentation process as well. So we can't just look at gut flora, we're also looking at fungi and saying fungi, they're fungi, right? We can't also say what's normal, why are they there, and what's their implication to, again, a healthy GI tract, especially a hindgut. We know when this process of bacterial fermentation occurs, we're going to see a lot of changes, but specifically we're going to see byproducts of microbial fermentation, and those are volatile fatty acids. That is that key energy source that is so important for these animals. A percentage of those volatile fatty acids are going to be absorbed right across the wall of the cecum directly into the bloodstream, but also a large percentage are contained within that cecotrope and re-ingested and then absorbed within the small intestine. So again, many, many different types of, of volatile fatty acids. This is the energy source for all herbivores, uh, not just rabbits, but an extremely compo important component of things. So when we keep the bacteria happy and healthy, we control their environment, proper nutrition, proper hydration, being careful about what medications we choose, those bacteria do their job. They maintain healthy numbers, we have good, give good biosis, they maintain that process of microbial fermentation. We change that environment, whether we're cognizant of changing it or not, whether it's an environmental factor or a nutritional factor, we can destabilize that environment very quickly. Dysbiosis can occur, we see a shift in the pH. When you change the pH, certain bacteria do better at certain pHs, and really, really quickly you can change the colonization of that hindgut, which has a huge implication in how that hindgut functions. Again, some of this I kind of hit on already, but the three sections of the rabbit colon, we know that we're going to separate the ascending and the descending, sometimes also referred to as proximal and distal. So proximal is closer, basically, towards the upper component, distal is moving away. But the fusae coli is what controls the functionality, that colonic separation mechanism that I've talked about, in that component of the GI tract. And the autonomic nervous system, as well as the adrenal glands, potentially have implications in the fusae coli. So if you think about a rabbit's association with stress leading to GI disease, well, if that stress is affecting the adrenal glands, which is affecting the actual production and functionality of the fusae coli, there's no wonder that we're predilecting the GI stasis because the fusae coli is what's controlling that movement in the hindgut. That is one of the cutest pictures I've ever seen up there. <laughs> proximal colon. So let's focus on the proximal colon. Okay, that's the functional component of the colon. The hostra, the tania. And what's going to occur there is we're going to see the movement of particles of fiber back and forth between the proximal colon and the cecum. It's that retrograde and normal grade movement. When I say normal grade, that's normal direction, retrograde, opposite direction. So that's the movement of those particles of fiber between the, retro, or between the actual proximal colon and the cecum. Rabbits have another very unique anatomical structure called warzans, and they live within the actual proximal colon. Now, nobody definitively knows what they do, but if you read the literature, what they believe is they increase surface area of the colon, and they help that mechanically differentiate and break the fiber apart because the process of fiber differentiation is how that colonic separation mechanism works. Again, distal colon, no hostry, no tania bands, it's smooth walled, it's covered, and it's basically producing mucus from the goblet cells as those cecotrophs are excreted out the back door. So here's that same picture again. 
So again, ilium, sacculus rotundus, ascending and or proximal colon with our hostry, as you can see right here. Our fusi coli would live right here. Here's our descending colon, smooth wall, mostly goblet cells providing mucus uh, on top of that cecotroph. So again, rabbits do not completely ferment fiber. They rely on their colonic separation mechanism to help them break fiber and differentiate it. What that washback mechanism does is it takes larger particles of fiber based on size, moves them out the GI tract, out the back door, and makes poop. We all know how good rabbits are at making poop, right? At the same time, the smaller particles of fiber, again based on size, mucus, bacteria, hydration, get moved to the periphery of the ascending colon into those hostry, and they move retrograde back up into the cecum for further fermentation. That's a colonic separation mechanism, where the colon is separating particles of fiber based on size, getting rid of what they can't use, get it out of the way, but hold on to the key components that we want to hold on to. So why is this colonic separation mechanism so important in our hindgut fermenters? Well, the first part is that it concentrates the digestive effort in the cecum. We know the majority of those fermenting bacteria, fungi, yeast, other uh, organisms live preeminently in the cecum. So we want to keep those nutrients that are most digestible in the cecum to really be as efficient and as effective at that process of bacterial fermentation as we can. We also take the large particles of fiber and we get them out of the system. We get them out of the way. If we get them out of the way, we're going to continue to stimulate that rabbit to eat because we need food, we need fiber going into the system because it's not nutrient dense. And lastly, we know that rabbits need to run in the wild to survive. The heavier they are, the slower they're going to run. So this process gets fiber, gets volume, and gets weight out of their system. So if they have to make a run for it, there's that much less bouncing around in their GI tract. So it's not only a nutritional functionality, but it's a predator-prey mentality as well with the fact that they want to be able to run away. Now this is the video that I was talking a little bit about. And one suggestion, if you ever have a video made, get an estimate before you have it made. $1,400. Yeah, that was a great expense report to turn into my boss, I'll tell you that. But I told her, I said, if I use this like 10 times a year for like 100 years, it's only like a buck and a half a time. All right. Oh, come on, you dirty butter. All right. So here's what I want us to be looking at. My laser pointer doesn't work. Okay. We're going to look at small, uh, kind of amber pieces of, of particles of fiber or smaller particles of fiber. The oblong pieces, longer particles of fiber. All the blue dots are supposed to be representative of gut flora, bacteria and fungi. So again, we recognize that that stomach is sitting all the way up here. We're not getting degradation of fiber in the stomach. We're taking all that fiber very rapidly down the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum. There's the distal end of the ileum and that dilation of the sacculus rotundus. And we're really, really rapidly pushing that fiber down into the hindgut. Hindgut is cecum and large intestine, as you can see here. So as that fiber wakes its way really, really, and this isn't just fiber, it's everything the rabbit is eating, it makes its way down into the cecum, we're going to begin to see really aggressive retrograde and normal grade peristalsis, not only within the cecum, but even within the large intestine. That's where we're seeing that back and forth movement, where what's happening is that the rabbit, particularly in the large intestine, is differentiating the particles of fiber based on size. Okay? As that process continues to occur and we get more and more ingested dumping in, We've got a very well-developed ileal cecal valve here, so once those particles enter, they can't go back up in there, the body starts to dump fluid into this system. As that fluid is dumping in, heat, fluid, bacteria, and food, we're beginning to see the production of volatile fatty acids, of which the cecal appendix is dumping bicarbonate into that system, buffering the production of those volatile fatty acids. As this process is occurring, the rabbit is beginning to say, man, I got all these big pieces of fiber that are too big. I want to get them out of the way. Move them to the center lumen of the large intestine. They move in a normal grade fashion, so normal direction, out the back door, ascending colon, descending colon, fusi coli. We're going to concentrate, pull those nutrients off. We're going to cover these in mucus. We're going to put them out the back door. We're going to make poop. That's our long stranded fiber. But at the same time, all these smaller particles of fiber, mucus, bacteria, soluble nutrients, the rabbits say, man, I got to hold on to that stuff. That's the good stuff. They move them to the periphery of the ascending colon into those hostry. Those are those pouch-like things I was showing you. And they move retrograde back up into the cecum for further fermentation. 
That's a colonic separation mechanism where rabbits are saying, I can't use these big particles of fiber, they're too big. I want to get them out of the way so I weigh less, so I'm stimulated to eat more. But I want to take all these small particles of fiber, all these bacteria, and I want to concentrate that digestive effort within the cecum where I can continue to produce those volatile fatty acids. That's the process, again, of, of separating particles based on size. Now, over a period of time, and in rabbits two to three, three to four times a day, it just depends, the fusi coli at some point in time stimulates the entire contents of the cecum to empty much more rapidly, and that's our what? That's our cecotroph. Yeah, so a cecotroph by definition is contents of the cecum. Mostly smaller particles of fiber, gut flora, bacteria, volatile fatty acids, minerals, vitamins, whatever the case would be. And those things conglomerate into the form of a cecotroph. They pass in a normal grade fashion much more rapidly out the back door. Rabbit says, something smells good, it's time to eat a little snack, right? Okay, I don't know how they taste. I mean, have anybody tasted them? You don't want to admit that, I'm kidding. Yeah. And they re-ingest those. Now, how do they know to re-ingest those? And again, I don't know how people know this, but if you read the books, they talk about the smell. They talk about a hormonal shift within the body, and they also talk about the mechanical stimulation of feeling them being produced. But again, those cecotrophs are much more rapidly expelled than the stools are because we want to coat those cecotrophs in mucus by the goblet cells in the descending colon. We want to maintain the hydration, get them out the back door so the rabbit they can re-ingest them. Okay? Re-ingest those cecotrophs, dump them back up into the system so we can extract those key nutrients. I mean, rabbits were like the first recycler, right? They were recycling their own food. But that's how you can take an animal that weighs you know, three, four, five pounds and feed them a food that in all reality is not nutrient dense. When you look at an animal like a horse that's eight or 900 pounds, they simply have enough you know, GI volume and length and transit time that they can extract those nutrients the first time through. Rabbits cannot. Totally worth $1,400, wouldn't you say? So when they re-ingest that cecotroph, again, remember rabbits are swallowing the cecotroph whole. The cecotroph works its way down into the stomach, and it's covered in protective mucus, which is produced by the goblet cells in the descending colon. That mucus is allowing, there's many, many, many bacteria that are still living within that cecotroph, continuing that process of fermentation. When those cecotrophs get within the stomach, the pH of the stomach breaks down that mucus protective covering and the process of breaking down and extracting those nutrients by hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, within the stomach and within the small intestinal curves. Now, there's certainly a component of a cecotroph that's gonna work its way all the way back through the system again but the body is gonna extract all of those nutrients that were too bound up and or not part of the food the first time it went through the system. When we break cecotrophs down nutritionally, we know that look at the moisture content compared to a fecal stool. Look at the protein content of a cecotroph. Yet here's all that long-stranded fiber that we're dumping out of the system in the form of that fecal, okay? So you can clearly see that there's a significant nutritional difference between a cecotroph and a stool. Within that cecotroph, we've got essential amino acids, bacterial in origin. We've got caloric energy, metabolizable energy in the form of volatile fatty acids. And specific to rabbits, we've got vitamins B and vitamin K. Okay? Key, key nutrients that that rabbit is getting only from that cecotroph if it re ingests it. So the question was, why can't we analyze cecotrophs to identify the gut flora that are in there? Well, we can, we did. I don't have the answers yet to that. But you also have to recognize that the gut flora shifts during different components of high gut cecal fermentation. So it's certainly an indicator. And one of our primary goals with this study was to say, how good of an indicator is it to what's going on? So we evaluated stools and we evaluated cecotrophs to say, how does that compare to what we're finding in the cecum and what we're finding in the large intestine? We don't know. And maybe it is a very, very good indicator. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so let's kind of bring it home before we touch about nutrition a little bit. We know how important the colonic separation mechanism is. This is an area where rabbits and guinea pigs do differentiate. Uh, we know that rabbits are less effective at breaking down and degrading fiber uh, than guinea pigs and chinchillas are. We know that rabbits are reliant on the B-complex vitamins and vitamin K being synthesized by the microflora of the GI tract. So let's talk about diet a little bit. That's got to be a happy rabbit right there, right? <laughs> so again, premium high fiber choice grass hay. 
okay? And the key thing for me there is different types and different species. The reality is, is that in the wild, how many rabbits wake up in the morning and say, where's my bale of dry timothy egg? <laughs> That's not the way that it works, okay? Unfortunately, captivity, and with every captive species, we've messed them up, we do the best we can, but we want fiber, we want it always available, they're gonna pee on it, they're gonna sleep on it, they're gonna eat some of it. We want fresh, clean hay available to them all the time. The take home for me is different types of species. How many rabbits in the wild only eat one type of plant that's all they eat for 90% of their nutrition? That's not realistic. So diversity is important as long as we take into consideration our animal, how we're transitioning, how we're introducing new species if they're not used to that. Premium high fiber grass hay, depending on life stage, depending on animal's nutritional need. Uh, now I'm sure we could get into a lot of really awesome debates about how many pellets we should be feeding or should we or not. At the end of the day, pellets are providing a key nutrient that is not in hay. When we feed hay, we're getting fiber. That's what we're getting. We're getting a small amount of minerals, we're getting some protein, we're nearly not getting any consistent amounts of vitamins. Because when we dry hay, all of those natural vitamins go away. So we feed pellets preeminently to be focusing on the micronutrients. We're certainly getting some of the simpler carbohydrates, some of the fat, some of the protein, but I'm preeminently after the micronutrients when I'm feeding a pellet. That is why it's so important to feed just a recommended amount, okay? We always want to think about the animal's age, and you can't just look at the back of a package and say every rabbit falls in that category. You have to look at the individual. They're all unique, just like you and I. But we want to take into consideration age, activity level, general health and well-being, uh, breed, and all those types of specificities, um, and really, really make sure that we're feeding just the recommended amount. Treats, and I need an honest answer here. How many human beings nutritionally need treats? <laughs> and see, nobody will even answer me. No, you don't. I know you would kick my butt in an argument with that one, but you don't. Here's the reality, though, is treats are about the human-animal bond, okay? It is about building that relationship. And as far as I'm concerned, fresh greens are our treats, okay? We can do such an awesome diversity of fresh greens, and I always talk to owners, and you guys know this, fresh greens are up here, fresh veggies are all the way down here, and fresh fruit is even lesser than that. And a grin, I always say this, and I'm not just up here, I always tell people, go to the House Rabbit Society's website. Awesome, great list of greens, okay? We want to focus on greens. I always personally recommend organic if owners can do it, if they can't grow it themselves. That's the tree category. We're getting moisture, we're getting vitamins, we're getting minerals. Not to mention all of those phytonutrients that honestly, we're just beginning to start to understand those. Great way to nutritionally uh, enrich these animals. Fresh, clean water. Um, again, I know that there's some House Rabbit Society's debate around bottles. My take home with this is that Anna Meredith at the University of Edinburgh did a study that showed that rabbits actually took 20 to 25% more water intake when they were offered multiple sources. The take home for me is hydration is key. We know in the wild these animals are getting a much significant higher level of hydration every single day. I think hydration has a lot to do with some of the diseases we see, so how can we get fluids into these animals? Up to you, I always recommend multiple sources whether it's their cage, whether it's their exercise area, whether you're transporting them, whatever the case would be. And then certainly, fresh greens. That can provide a lot of fresh moisture to these animals as well. Yeah? When we talk about, you know, the hay is, is food with nutrients, drying process, could a uh, diligent owner just feed nothing but greens? Yeah, and that's a great question. I mean, that's the reality of rabbits that live in the wild. The consistency and the challenge for me is what's the reliability of the greens that they can get? And a lot of these animals are not used to getting that type of forage and that type of intake. They certainly need very, very ample and high amounts of fiber. Fresh greens provide fiber, but obviously not at the level that you're gonna see in a dry grass hay. So I certainly know, and I've talked to many owners that feed a very large percentage of greens, and or they're cutting fresh grass from their backyard if that's available to them and it's safe to do that. So I certainly think that there's a diversity of ways that you can go about that. I still, at the end of the day though, when I think about a rabbit that's naturally in the wild, the massive diversity that they get, they're not simply thinking, okay, I need to eat this grass hay because it's got iron in it, or I need to eat this one because it's got vitamin D. They're getting the key nutrients by the massive diversity they're being fed. I think we will still struggle to meet all those needs by just feeding as many different greens as we could get. Now, some people may disagree with me on that. That's the recommendation that I try to follow because I also don't know that owners are gonna be consistent in the variability and continue to offer different types all year around based on what's available. It's no different than when I talk to dog and cat owners and especially ferret owners about raw diets. I love raw diets. I love home prepared diets. But what's an owner's capability of consistently providing the massive diversity of nutrients that we know that these animals really, really need? Understand the individual. And that's the take home for me with that. I look at every animal uniquely, OK? 
Okay? You can certainly look at the types of foods that are out there, look at the packaging, but you have to look at the animal. Do they have medical conditions? Do they have other issues? Do the mom and dad have multiple animals? You have to look at all those factors and make the right recommendation because otherwise you can set that owner and that animal up uh, for not being successful. We certainly know about the nutritional benefits of hay, the plant silicates that are in there, the indigestible fiber that stimulates peristalsis, keeps that entire GI tract moving, helps to maintain proper pH balance, specifically in the hindgut. That's all about that environment for those gut flora. Uh, stimulates water intake, a lot, a lot of benefits there. But one of the things I really try to spend a lot of time talking to owners and vet students about is thinking about them, and you guys are kings of this. I don't need to educate you on this at all. You Actually, you just educated me. But focusing on letting these animals behave naturally. Okay, In the wild, they're spending a huge percentage of their time grazing, foraging, moving around. Yet we bring all their nutrients right to them in a cage or in a bowl. So using hay, using different types of hay, different species offered in different ways, is a good way to give them some enrichment. It's a good way to give them something to do because they're not having to force to be doing those natural activities in the wild. And for a lot of these species, specifically these real small prey species, it gives them a sense of security. Okay? It's like having a hide house. Oh, I get 10 minutes now. Did they get 10 minutes before? <laughs> they did, they just ignored you. So I get to ignore you too. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't want to mess with you, I don't think. My point is that a sense of security. So here's Mr. Hamster, okay? And he's hiding under his pile of hay. In his mind, there's some red-tailed hawk circling. When I pick up that pile of hay and I throw it to the other side of the cage, he's a hamster, so what's he going to do first? He's going to try to kill me, right? <laughs> what's he going to do for the next two hours? Okay, he's going to rebuild his house. He's going to be enriched. He's going to have something to do rather than just sitting in that cage and staring out at the whole world that he doesn't understand. So all of these small herbivores, not just rabbits, and you guys have the opportunity to educate owners on all species, talk to them about safety enriching these animals. Every guinea pig and small rabbit that comes into my practice gets one of these. They can hide in it, they can be a prey species, they can put a window over here or a veranda out the back, whatever the case may be. But we know they're going to chew, but it allows them to be themselves as best they possibly can in an environment that is obviously introducing a lot, a lot of stress. Okay? I don't need to preach to you guys about this. We want to enrich our lives, we want to challenge owners to think about different ways to enrich that. So what is hay? Hay is nothing more than dried, preserved plant. Okay? That's all that it is. We're after fiber in hay. So our preference, we want to keep hay stored dry. We want to preferably keep it out of direct light. Light does break down chlorophyll, which dries out hay and has an impact to palatability. But we know hay can taste a lot. I don't know if it tastes different. It can smell different. It can look different. It can, you know, all those factors have a lot to do with where it's grown. So the key take home there is that I always talk to owners about really making sure that we're getting animals used to different types of hay. You've all had that rabbit. We've got that amazing, beautiful Timothy, and you offer it, and it looks at you like, what is this? I'm not going to eat that. Okay? They perceive differences with hay that you and I are not aware of. So by feeding different diversity of hay, we desensitize them to some of those changes that naturally occur. And you guys have struggled with this a lot more with animals than even probably I have. Timothy is obviously the first one we think of. Why do we think of Timothy first? Does anybody know? It's great nutritional, low in fiber, or excuse me, not wouldn't be good, high in fiber, low in protein, low in calcium, tends to be pretty palatable. Honestly, we think of Timothy first because somebody started saying this is great for rabbits. I'm not knocking on Timothy. My point, my take home here is that orchard is just as good of a hay from a nutritional standpoint as Timothy is. Okay? Tends to be a little bit more leafy. I find that rabbits and guinea pigs who are kind of for snippety of a hay, a lot of times will like orchard. Okay? But from a fiber standpoint, from a protein standpoint, from a calcium standpoint, uh, they're almost identical. We can even look at oat hay, and I love oat hay for small rodents like rats and mice and hamsters and gerbils. The little immature seed heads that are in there are great natural forage for these animals, but I'm still staying true to fiber content, to low protein, to low calcium. Okay? And then for your tree hugger clientele, which we have some, and I'm a tree hugger so I can say that, we certainly have organic hays. They're always going to be a mixture though. Okay? We're typically going to see uh, timothy and orchard, occasionally some clover. Again, most of the grass hays that we're going to be growing are organic by nature anyway. By certifying them, it simply is a seven, five to seven year process of sowing. No chemicals have been utilized on those fields. Certainly another option, but again, nothing nutritionally superior to organic hay when we think about fiber, we think about protein, so on and so forth. So nutritionally, grass hays are all equal. Uh, that is the take home. And again, I can tell you after doing tens of thousands of analyses, the divergence while there is minimal. So different taste, different texture, different smell, mix hays together. Great feedback, and, and, and I can't say that I've personally seen that. She's
she's got way more experience than I do, so I would take that one to heart. Again, they're a concentrate selector. They're going to find what tastes good, and if they can eat that first, and you keep putting it in there, uh, they're going to keep doing that. So alfalfa is kind of obviously the kind of ugly redheaded stepchild of the grass family, okay? <laughs> higher in protein, higher in calcium, lower in fiber. Very palatable as we know, so it's certainly something we can use at different life stages. But for that typical adult animal, we don't need that additional protein. We do not need that additional calcium. And certainly depending on cut, with grass haze, we're going to get anywhere from two to three cuts a year, depending on where it's grown. Alfalfa, we can get five, six, even seven cuts of hay, depending on where it's grown. But again, typically higher in calcium and typically higher in protein and lower in fiber. So high quality grass hay should be available all the time. You guys know this. Use it to enrich all of our species. I use it with birds. Uh, I use it with all kinds of species because it's safe. Uh, we know that there's variation from bag to bag, and that's the key take home right there. Right? <laughs> so let's hit on mixes of pellets real quick. Uh, you guys have been preaching the choir for long before I was probably around about this. But we know when we talk about muesli mixes and we talk about pellets, we're getting a diversity of nutrients. We also know that we're a concentrate selector. So if this is Mike or the rabbit, I'm eating that first because it looks like bacon to me, which hopefully it isn't, but I'm totally going to eat that first. Then I'm going to eat this little thing up here, okay? It's probably extruded. It probably tastes good. I don't even have to chew it. Then I'm going to eat this. There's no way I'm eating that, okay? Why am I not eating that? It's not nearly as tasty as other stuff. And Nancy LaRoche, you guys all know Nancy, amazing woman who did not make it. I feel terrible. She got stuck at the airport, but she told me a story about rabbits that she rescued that were on a muesli mix. She's just trying to get them comfortable. She's feeding the muesli mix. They would pick out everything and they'd leave that and they'd turn around and pee in the bowl. <laughs> like, that's a perfect rabbit. And what does the owner do? Oh, that's disgusting. Let me fill your bowl right back up again so you can continue to grow the like. If they eat that whole bowl, they're going to get nutrients. But again, they're not getting that balanced nutrient every single time. So it looks great. It's typically cheaper on the shelf. Uh, but again, we all know the negatives that are associated with it. Higher carbohydrates, simple sugar, and we're not going to get the fiber. Again, that probably melts in my mouth. I don't even have to chew it. I'm not getting the wear and tear on the teeth. I'm not getting the stimulation of GI peristalsis. I'm allowing the gut flora to change because of shifts in pH. I'm changing my colonic separation mechanism. All of those things are negative and could potentially lead to problems uh, in the long haul. So uniform pellets are our best choice. In theory, there is bacon in there. I hope not, but I can't pick it out. Okay? It doesn't matter what bite I take. I'm getting balanced nutrients every single time from my micro-ingredients to my micronutrients, my vitamins, my minerals, uh, so on and so forth. Feed the recommended amount. Don't let owners choose it. Okay? Not all are created equal, and I think this is exactly what Dr. Smith's lecture was on yesterday, which I was really bummed I wasn't here. Take the time to flip the bag over, look at the nutrients, look at the ingredients. You guys are educated enough to understand that why should there be corn in there? There shouldn't be corn in there. Let's educate ourselves. Let's really dig into the nutrients, not just the fiber level. Talk about vitamins, talk about minerals. Uh, you hit on prebiotics a little bit ago. There's certainly many, many add-ons that we can think about that can provide benefit to these animals. It's around the right type of ingredients and feeding the recommended amount. So treats, the lower in protein, fat, calcium, and sugar, the better. We want fiber no matter where we can get it. We don't want synthetic anything. We don't want artificial colors. We don't want artificial flavors. We don't want artificial preservatives. There's no need for them to be in there. We don't want yogurt drops. <laughs> and this is on Google, and I absolutely love this picture, okay? I know he's smiling, but right now his stomach and his GI tract are saying, don't eat it, man. Just don't eat it. <laughs> Hay-based treats we want to start with. Think about freeze-dried fruits and vegetables as an option. We don't want to use dry because they use sugar as part of the drying process, but freeze-drying is certainly an appropriate way to go. And at the end of the day, you can feed packaged treats. I really would suggest looking at the greens, really focus on feeding a diversity of those. Uh, if you can. 